You're listening to Body IO FM with your hosts, Kiefer and Dr. Rocky, where cutting edge science meets the razor's edge of health and performance. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Body IO FM. This is your host, Kiefer, and co host, Dr. Rocky. Hello, Kiefer. Yes, again, we've got him trained to come in on cue finally. Um, we like to mention our sponsor, Hylete Athletic Wear. Uh, you can find a discount code on body.io for 25% off your first purchase there. And on today's show, we have Alex Navarro and Mary Guinness, the two um, personalities behind the Transforming Recipe book. And uh, ultra low carb edition, and also the website Fit Living Foodies. So, hello, this is Mary. Hi, guys, it's Alex. Uh, today, I thought we would do something interesting, something that I don't hear very often, and that's a show about cooking and the modifications and the things you have to do uh, when you're on a ultra low carb diet. So, often you're using a lot of ingredients that you aren't definitely aren't standard. And you have to do different things. Cooking is all about chemistry. And by not using carbohydrates or starches, we've definitely changed the chemistry of everything going on and what we're cooking. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some of their uh, successes and failures and some of my own as well. I like to experiment in the kitchen with sometimes some crazy stuff that somehow works out every once in a while. And other times I'm throwing away $100 worth of food because it turned out horrible. So let's, what got you, so Mary, for those of you who don't know, is, uh, she's kind of the creative brains behind the book. She, uh, creative as in pictures, uh, graphic design, layout, uh, she did a fantastic job with the book and educated herself with food photography uh, to make sure that that came out great. And then Alex is the mastermind in the kitchen who likes mixing stuff and possibly throwing it away or hitting a major <laughs> success. Yeah, sometimes it's definitely a hit or miss, and uh, the more we got to experimenting, the more we understood what would work versus what wouldn't work. So luckily, at the beginning, there was a little bit more food that went to waste, but now we're we're getting the system down pretty well. So what got you kind of started on messing around with ultra-low-carb recipes? I know you, you got some for me in my first book, Carb Night. I've got quite a few in there, but I definitely did not play with the wide variety of ingredients that you you two have been using in your your cooking. Well, it started a little bit before that. I've just always loved to cook, loved experimenting with food, and I want to eat well. So once I figured out what the guidelines were and got some ideas from Carb Night, some of the recipes you were creating in there, it just was a matter of playing with different things. And again, kind of what you talked about, experimenting with new ingredients. Once I realized the the world of fat options and what I had available and what we were allowed to use, it really opened the door for being able to just play with different things. And most of it started just with experimenting for myself. And then it it turned into something that I started sharing with clients because once they started using Carb Night, they were always looking for new ways to make stuff at home, make stuff that they could eat, make stuff that their families would like. And that's really where the deeper experimentation came from. And I think too, um, during the contest prep, I mean, you have to be really um, creative as far as like what your your meals and making them taste great. So, I mean, during when we used to compete and having trying to come up with these meals for the week, you have to make sure that what you're at least making tastes good. So, you know, experimenting with spices or whatnot and sauces to make everything taste great. So, so you're telling me you didn't just enjoy eating tilapia and asparagus? I didn't <laughs> cut it for you? No, I mean. <laughs> After a while, I just, yeah, it's, it's, contest where it was no fun at all. There's only so many ways that you can make tilapia and asparagus taste good. Yeah. And that's sometimes lost. Both Alex and Mary have competed before in a variety of different competitions. Alex has done fitness and bikini and Mary has competed in bikini. So they know how horrible, uh, for one, a bad prep diet can be on the palate and, Uh, Just to how difficult it is to make low carb food taste good, whether that's really high protein or uh, higher fat 
a more balanced type of meal. Uh, you know, this is, uh, they, we, we paused there for a second and they actually started to talk about, uh, their latest creation. And why don't you two talk about that? Cause Rocky wanted to know where they got, what, what was it Rocky you're asking about? Oh, they had posted on Facebook, uh, a Talenti gelato. That was a black cherry flavor, which I had not seen, which made me go to the website to see what all the other flavors they had. So. <laughs> That's what we did too. That's probably one of my favorites too, the black cherry. <laughs> So, of course, ice cream is one of those things that is hard to replicate in the low-carb world. But that, of course, didn't stop anybody from trying. Of course not. There, there shouldn't be any limitations as far as I'm concerned. It's just a matter of trying different things out. So the first thing we did was buy an ice cream maker, which was like Christmas. <laughs> I was really <laughs> excited. And what was great is actually the, the ice cream maker itself came with a bunch of great recipes. So it gave me an idea of what would need to be in it. And I, it was just a matter of substituting out the higher carb items, obviously the sugar, some of them called for regular milk. So at this point, we've played with two different versions. Uh, one is just a plain vanilla and one's a butter pecan, which I'm really excited about. It's actually in the freezer freezing right now. So we'll have to give that a try when we get home. So what did you substitute out? You don't have to give anybody the exact recipe, but what was it that you found uh, that you had to switch out to try to get the right you know, this is very difficult. And for those of you who've tried experimenting, you know, getting the right texture um, and all of that to work is not an easy task. And ice cream was the one thing I never got a chance to tackle. Uh, so why don't you? Well, luckily there wasn't too much that needed be, to be switched out. It was mostly the sugar. That was the most common one that needed to. Obviously, some of the more exotic flavors, you know, we're not going to be able to get into putting pieces of Snickers bars in it, but we do have some fun ideas for using some of our other low carb desserts and being able to throw those in. And I mean, the base of most of them is heavy cream and um, eggs, whether it's egg whites, egg yolks, the whole egg. There are a few different variations that I'm going to play with and see which one works out the best. And it makes sense to use the heavy cream because if you think about it, ice cream is basically just cold butter with some sugar added. Exactly. So luckily it wasn't too difficult. It's just a matter of playing with the right ratios of everything. Right. Because too much cream frozen is going to be rock hard. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And did you find any way to mitigate that or did you just have to deal with it being somewhat rock hard? Right now, the, the buttercream one that I just did is a little bit creamier. It's definitely not as hard. And I think that um, the half and half actually helped a lot with that. So I did a little bit of heavy cream and a little bit of half and half. Um, I'm also looking into, what was the ingredient, Mary, that you found? Uh, lecithin? Uh, it, you got to make sure it's not soy lecithin, though. We were, yeah. we were looking that up to see the different variations, because that, apparently that's what's added to a lot of, a lot of recipes to aid in the, the, the texture. Yeah, mm -hmm, the creaminess. Yeah, that, you could try, um, I don't know if you've tried it or not yet, but MCT oil. Uh, oh, that, that's a good idea. Yeah, that doesn't, uh, that won't freeze at all. Uh, so adding that in could could give you a little bit of creaminess to the texture, and it's a really light oil too, which you know helps with uh, not being too viscous and getting really hard. Perfect, and that's something that most people have already. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not that it's the greatest thing compared to coconut oil, but when you're talking about freezing something, it's definitely better than coconut oil. So whether you um, are looking at these ice cream recipes or any of the baking stuff, is there a sweetener that you guys prefer or find that works better than the other? Well, the primary one that we use is definitely stevia. Um, the challenge there is when recipes call for a cup of sugar, it's hard to replace that volume. So I'm trying to avoid using some of the bulk sweeteners, some of the artificial ones like Splenda or Truvia or sucralose, um, mostly because of the potential for still in it causing an insulin response. Um, so I would say in terms of switching out sugars, we are primarily using stevia, but the still the challenge of the volume changing. Um, mostly using liquid stevia, we do use the powdered occasionally. And some of those um, stevia products do have like maltodextrin in it or a de was it dextrose that we saw added in it. So we kind of look at that too as well and try to go for the pure extract. Yeah, unfortunately, most, most of the sweeteners do. That's one thing that makes the Tarani syrups nice is they're just pure sucralose in there and, and water basically, I guess. That's actually what we used, <clears throat> excuse me, 
<clears throat> in the uh, buttercream ice cream, we used a little bit of the cinnamon brown sugar Tarani syrup, and I think that really gave it an extra, extra punch. Now, if you, you could look into, there's probably a way to buy pure sucralose. I know that they used to make little tablets and things like that, but if you dissolve that in MCT oil, you got kind of like the perfect sweetener for ice cream. Perfect. Mm-hmm. That would definitely be worth a try. They, this is this is the part I always like is trying to think of creative things to combine together. And uh, the nice thing about MCT oil, unlike other things that I combine, is it doesn't have any taste, inherent mm-hmm. taste at all. Uh, so you're not going to add some fishy taste or olive oil or something like that. It's going to be just a nice, clean, creamy finish with that. And what I like about <laughs> what I like Let's about keep the context <laughs> appropriate here. I'm sorry. Uh, what I like about doing little combinations like that too is that it's not going to be difficult for the end user. You know, again, I want to make recipes that anybody can go out and make and not have to try to find exotic ingredients or pay a lot of money for something that they may only use a small fraction of. So, you know, something like MCT oil if if they were to you know, buy sucralose and then, like you said, dissolve it in. That would be another easy thing for most people to be able to do. Yeah, maybe we. Yeah, should. there's a there, there's a newer sweetener on the market now, the monk fruit extract. Have you tried played around with that one at all, either? I have not. That sounds interesting. Can you where can you get that? I've oh, you can get it at any of the stores or on yeah. Amazon. Both I mean, it depends if you want to get the powder or the liquid. Oh, okay. So that's. Uh, You know, talking about the sweeteners is really important because, you know, if you're going to bake bread or anything, this is why low carb bread is still not on the horizon. There's some out there that are like, you know, claim no carb and they're flaxseed and they actually taste like crap, uh, even though they claim that they're, you know, as close to bread as you can get. And that's because the gluten in wheat that everybody is so terrified of uh, is what does the cross linking and allows bread to, uh, basically give off CO2 and cause the fluffiness and causes it to rise and whatnot. And that's why flatter doughs like croissant dough doesn't rise and stays really light and flaky because that's actually gluten depleted flour. Uh, So we, there's this major problem whenever you're making anything that's going to be like pancakes or, um, bread or biscuits, uh, which you guys have, have formulated a biscuit recipe uh, you, you've got to find some way to replace those starches with something potentially that's going to hold together at least in a similar way. And, you know, what what's the ingredient you found to kind of play around with that? Well, the baking powder works pretty well. That's what we use in the biscuit recipe. Uh, another example in the pancake recipe, we use the sparkling water. So there's already there's a little CO2, CO2 in the water that helps it rise. But when it comes to baking something, the, the sparkling water just isn't going to work because once you mix everything together and you put it in the oven, it's just sitting too long. So I'm trying an experiment with the baking soda and baking powder combination. But again, I'm making sure that we're not adding a bunch of carbs to it either. So that will take a little bit of fine tuning. Right. And what's your base? What is it? Because I used to always use almond flour or hazelnut meal or something like that. Um. Uh, for the biscuits, we used the coconut flour, and that seemed to work pretty well. And I found a cupcake experiment that I'm going to work on, uh, actually using almond flour. So I noticed you guys have stayed away from xanthan gum. Uh, is there any reason for that? It's a great thickening agent. Uh, technically, it's a fiber. Uh, and notice you don't play around with it very much, even though it's pretty easy to find in the store. We actually just got it in. So the oh. experimentation is, is going to begin any day now. Yeah, I know. Is uh, that the same thing as guar gum? No, guar gum is different. But the same idea in terms of what it's going to bring to the baked goods. Well, what's the fear with guar gum? Is there, is there an equivalent fear with xanthan gum? I know people are always up in arms about that, even though guar gum is one of the best things you can give to your gut bacteria to make it colonize and uh, get more bulk. Uh, apparently that's lost somewhere because it's artificial. So is there any backlash against xanthan gum right now? Not that I've seen. The only thing is that we got some feedback from the first book and a lot of it was based around the difficulty in finding ingredients, specifically the flowers. So if people can't find the flowers, most likely they're not going to be able to get a hold of the xanthan gum to make the flowers work. So that would be my only concern. But you can order that stuff online. If, if people really want to be diligent about this, you can get it at Amazon, all those different places, right? I mean, crap. I, told Rocky about the research I found on galacto oligosaccharides. And before I know it, two days later, he's got like a pound of it. (laughs) 
<laughs> you can find anything on Amazon. You can find almost. anything, yes. And actually, what's nice it's about the xanthan gum is you can buy a lot of it for hardly anything. And you it's don't need cheap. too much of it either. What were we going to say, Rocky? Oh, I say you can find anything on Amazon. And, you know, if you say you can't find something, it's almost like a cop out these days, you know, unless you're like told so technologically in, not, not unsophisticated, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or, or just lazy. Yeah, I think that's what it is. It's the lazy factor. Isn't it something like Americans claim that they can't find 30 minutes a day to cook dinner, but the same people will spend an hour watching cooking shows? Exactly. Oh, which is amazing to me. And this is, you know, the cooking, low carb cooking is, of course, a challenge in itself and interesting. And we'll get to some of the disasters here soon because I, I know there's been some <laughs> disasters in the kitchen. But Michael Pollan pulled out some interesting statistics that uh, basically obesity uh, is a negative correlate to how often you cook. So in other words, the more often you cook for yourself, the far less likely you are to be obese. So saying you can't find 30 minutes a day to cook is really a cop out. And of course, I can't say anything because I pretty much walk down the street and eat out every meal these days. Uh, but I'm very careful about what I order. Uh, which I was going to say, that sounds like you're the walking oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And everybody's always pissed at me because I look fine. So, um, you know, you can eat out and not cook for yourself and make it work. But, you know, there's so much fun in cooking. You know, I remember playing with a chili recipe that I, I think it, I don't know if the salmon chili made it in your recipe book or not. Yeah. So, of course, you've got the challenge of beanless chili because I love chili. I love the flavors. and I love the texture. And I wanted something a little unique, so I created a, a salmon chili, and you don't get the texture of beans. So, of course, my first thought was, well, olives. They're pretty much fat and fiber, and they do somewhat have a texture of beans. So I add olives into it, and it really makes a pretty convincing chili. I don't know if you guys agree or not. Yeah, it was really delicious, actually. And you guys didn't even include it in the recipe book. See, they, snu I, they snubbed me like you wouldn't It believe. was after the fact. It yeah, was not I after was. the fact. I made that chili like years ago. <laughs> well, I had the original That'll chili. That'll cost you extra. It'll be in the appendix or the addendum. <laughs> exactly. <right? Yeah. laughs> the bonus book. But I think, you know, the other thing to keep in mind, you know, you mentioned these issues with uh, not cooking at home and obesity and things like that. You know, we're kind of in this day and age of internet, technology. We're really disconnected not only from friends, but family as well. And taking these opportunities to, you know, we have a lot of families that do carb night, carb backloading, um, and having that opportunity to spend with your kids and doing something with them to engage with them. Like we don't really engage with them anymore. So I think that's really another important social aspect that goes along with this. So when you two cook, uh, I often call Mary and Alex, uh, Marlex because it's a lot <laughs> easier to reference them when we're talking about cooking. So when Marlex is in the kitchen, do you guys share a lot of the tasks and putting stuff together? I mean, is it a fun friendship building activity or do you end up hating each other after the process every time? <laughs> well, I usually do most of the cleaning up. <laughs> Alex is usually the one that's cooking. Um, I'll offer to help out a little bit. And some once in a while, I'll, I'll go in there and make some kind of low carb uh, Filipino dish or Asian dish to kind of throw that in there. Yeah, but for the most part, it's it's me doing the cooking. <laughs> so this isn't any type of friendship building or community building at all that you do when you're going through this process? Not so much in the actual cooking part, in the eating part, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was kind of get I you know, I wanted to go back to, uh, to Rocky's point, and, you know, this is a great way to teach your kids about food and not the way that they probably know or understand food, which is what's in the freezer that I can pull out and throw in the microwave. Well, that's actually one thing I've noticed a lot in my family. So it it took me it took me a year or so to kind of get my family to wrap their head around the idea of carb night and going ultra low carb. And once I got one family member on, they all followed. And one of my favorite things is getting a message from my sister saying how much my niece loves the recipes and how much fun she has making them with her. So that was great. Yeah, this, you know, it, it's it's a rare opportunity because the way I learned to cook, um, my parents, neither one cooked very much. I mean, an exotic cooking uh, adventure for them was macaroni and cheese out of the box and holding hot dogs over our gas range to cook them. Um, so there wasn't a lot of 
cooking going on, especially as I grew up and was in high school. And the way I learned to cook was I literally looked in the cabinets for stuff that was going bad, for things that were expiring, and trying to figure out what I could do with them. And the first thing that got me cooking was cookies, obviously. I was a fat kid, so that was the go-to. Uh, but, you know, I pulled stuff out of everywhere, like bananas that were almost going rotten. I found some almond extract in the cabinet. I don't even know why I was there because we never used it. You know, I found all these great things and I just start putting them together. Uh, and I think, you know, this low carb, you know, being on this low carb and helping your children understand it gives them the same opportunity to have that kind of sense of creation and wonder and making something new and trying something new. And trust me, I've made some stuff that's horrible um but in the process you know it kept me wanting to play with more and more things and got me cooking more you know just getting your kids to spend time in the kitchen just having fun trying to make something uh you know i i think would be invaluable it would be something they could carry with them forever i agree i i wish that we had opportunities like home ec again in schools because i mean that's not something that was around when i was growing up i always heard my mom talk about it And it just makes sense and not because we're trying to train people to be homemakers, but just to be able to understand what's in our food and how to put things together so that, again, you're you're more likely to enjoy the process and make things that are good for you. Yeah, cooking is fun. Do you ever do you ever force your daughters to to sit down and play with any of this stuff with you, Rocky, or? You know, we, I don't force them to eat the low carb foods that I make, but, you know, a lot of times what we'll do um, is we'll make two foods and one might be low carb and my, one's going to be like the regular recipe, but we're still doing it together. And I think that even though they might not be choosing that low carb alternative, at least it's on their mind and they're thinking about it and it's not going to register right now, but you know, it'll be one of those things where they'll ask me, Oh, are you carb nighting tonight? And they know what it means. I mean, they know that I don't eat carbs during the week. So for example, um, we took the pancake recipe out of the book and we made waffles. And so we made um, some traditional waffles and we made some of the, the book recipe waffles and they tried them both. I mean, um, so they, they are still kind of trying to expand their palate and at least being open to trying some of these things. And that's really what you want to kind of influence. You know, you're not trying to lock, you know, um, put them into a, a paradigm, but you want to make sure they're aware of these different things. I think that's really the most important thing. So let's move on to worst disasters. And these can, we can start with maybe worst physical disasters where you tried to make ice cream and it came out just runny. Uh, if you have anything like that or, or taste combinations where you're like, wow, this is beautiful. This is going to be fantastic. And one bite, the rest of it went in the garbage. (laughs) Well, one thing that stands out is when I first started playing with cookie recipes, we got the taste down. I mean, they, they all tasted great. I probably made six different batches, different recipes in one day. And the challenge was keeping the cookie together. So it looked great when it sat on the pan and it tasted great once you put it in your mouth, but picking it up, it literally just fell apart, like crumbs everywhere. So it tasted great, but that's not a cookie. That's just a pile of crumbs. And did that stop you from eating it, even though it was a pile of crumbs after you grabbed it? No, absolutely not. (laughs) We ate every last crumb. (laughs) And it's funny too, because when there's like technical issues with the machines, like yesterday with the ice cream machine and Alex, Alex gets so frustrated and I come in there, um... That's how it's supposed to work. It looked like something was wrong with it. The way the machine was acting it was making this noise and it wasn't turning like I thought it should have. <laughs> Turns out it was fine. So th- there was no problem there. So basically a massive mechanical failure that <laughs> was not a failure of the equipment. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> that's why that's why Mary is the technical side of things. <laughs> and that, yeah. that doesn't do any like community or friendship building between you two? It does. It definitely does. <laughs> Really? Does it build more of a hate relationship than a hate love relationship? The, okay, you don't need, you don't even need to answer at this point because basically the silence the silence was the answer, which is yes. There's probably a lot of animosity floating around when these events happen. I mean, we have our moments, you know, but for the most part, we you know we try to help each other for sure. So, Marlex is a torn entity. Yes. <laughs> In terms of things that that really tasted bad, the first time that I ever made the turnip mash, I didn't take all of the skin off, which is really, really important because it's horribly bitter. bitter. It's really bitter. So there was there was nothing I could do to salvage that recipe at that point. It was pretty much I I couldn't put it down. So I had to throw it away. Uh, How many turnips went 
to their grave over that? Probably like five, unfortunately. Oh, wow. That's a lot of turnips. Wow. Yeah, and some of the dishes that Alex can't have because of the cheese, I end up eating all of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> like those two little pumpkin pies, because she went on, um, she went out of town, I ended up eating both of those. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not complaining, but <laughs> it's a lot of food. <laughs> it's dangerous. That's That's one reason, you know, cooking with friends and family or inviting them over can be really advantageous sometimes because you you make an entire pumpkin pie and if it's just you and that's sitting in the refrigerator guess what's gonna happen when it's time to get a snack it's like oh well that's low carb obviously i can eat the whole thing for a quick snack yeah it's happened on multiple occasions especially when we're trying to cook multiple dishes in a sitting and then our fridge is full of food which is great but at the same time yeah we end up going and snacking on Probably too many things. You should see our, our freezer right now and how many frozen treats we have. Yeah, ice creams, a lot of the, uh, what did we just shoot? Put out there, the white pistachio bites, a bunch of those, a bunch of chocolate bars. All low carb, luckily, but still, too many sweet treats. Still, there are unfortunately calories. There's only so big of a caloric load you can uh, withstand before noticing something. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I won't always say it, it's, it's oddly enough, like it, it's a much, much wider window, luckily, than eating carb-based products. Um, but it's, it's still something you need to be cognizant of. Luckily, the bulk of those are in the freezer, so I, I'm not as concerned of, of them going bad versus the ones that are sitting in the fridge. Right. It, there's, uh, you know, but being frozen, though, is not always a deterrent. Nope. nope. <laughs> Especially now that it's Actually getting could hot. could be the opposite, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Exactly. With the temperatures going up, it's, it's, fun. it's nice to be able to grab something that's cold. So what if, uh, you know, so, so you've got, like, the turnips, is that it? Is that your worst taste disaster? Um, Taste-wise, I would say that was probably the one that stood out in terms of just really there was nothing I could do to make it better. Whereas other things, they might not taste great, but I'll still probably end up eating it because I just don't like to waste food. Yeah, and that obviously isn't going to make it in the recipe book. Correct. <laughs> I would say we did end up experimenting with a, a chicken pot pie. So we used the coconut flour crust, and then we actually used the biscuit recipe to try to make a topping. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it needs some tweaking, both for the filling and the way the topping laid, but it mm -hmm. has potential. It just didn't look that pretty. The taste yeah. was almost there. So you, you could call it some sort of like mutant shepherd's pie or something because shepherd's <laughs> pie usually looks like hell. Exactly. Uh, except you just don't. Have you tried that? Is, is there a shepherd's pie in the recipe? There book? is. I yes. thought there was. You use the mashed turnips on there. We okay. actually used a cauliflower mash. Oh, uh, the cauliflower mm -hmm. mash. But that one was that one's a hit. Yeah, it's amazing how creative you can be and the different things you can come up with with uh, items you never imagined transforming. And hence that's, you know, the title of of your book, right, is that. Was there a philosophy behind that? Yeah, it was the recipes. I'm sorry. The recipes that we transformed into low carb that will then transform you into whether it's improved health or aesthetic. And are you looking at transforming like other endpoint transformations? You know, paleo is unfortunately very popular right now, but uh, there's a lot of people, at least with food fears. Uh, have you looked at, you know, any of these other kind of... Um, paradigms to transform into yes absolutely paleo is definitely obviously a popular one and it wouldn't be too far off from what we're already doing i would say the only thing was would be substituting um, more of the the dairy products that we use one thing interesting that at least paleo opens up is you could use potato starch uh, with some sort of added protein like uh, powdered egg powdered egg would actually probably work really well those combinations are going to give you something similar in consistency to, say, flour that's got a protein component and a starch component. Uh, are those kind of the things you're looking at doing eventually, or have you thought about that? Or Yes, we've definitely thought about it. And in fact, those could be great um, ideas for someone's backload or carbonite, too, if they, if they wanted to stay gluten-free. Yeah, so I, I assume that's going to be... Uh, a whole nother series of books. A whole nother series of books. <laughs> we have a lot of a lot of ideas, a lot of plans in the future. 
And those are somewhat idea. I mean, you can get really good, gly, uh, you know, glycemic index and the insulin index when you switch away from some of these uh, wheat based products and use some of the simpler starches like uh, potato starch or rice, rice flour, if you want to combine that in there and add some protein to make it work a little better. But it definitely takes a lot of work. Definitely. And a lot of hit or miss. And I think one of the things I've found is start off small. You know, don't try to make a whole batch of something because if it doesn't work out, it's just, it's a lot of product and ingredient wasted. So trying to, if I find a recipe that I want to play with or tweak, it's cut it down as small as I can to that would still give me a good end result uh, to at least know if it, if it worked or not. You were going to say something in there, Rocky, I cut you off. Yeah, it, no, it's okay. Um, Kiefer had mentioned the four-liter word calorie. And uh, so, you know, sometimes when you're transforming some of these recipes, you're using things like coconut flour or, or almond flour which tend to be more calorie dense. Have you found it difficult trying to keep um, or balance that caloric load with the satiety factor with some of these recipes? Do you find any difficulties with any ones in the book? Mostly with things like the biscuits, because obviously the main ingredient is the coconut flour. So it's just a matter of pairing that with something else in that meal to make it so that it's a satisfying meal, but doesn't add again, too much, too many calories to it. But otherwise, most of the other ingredients where it uses a small amount, we're looking at a tablespoon, two tablespoons. So it's not adding a whole lot more. So you could use uh, the the famous picture from your book. Uh, Everybody loves this picture. And that's the burger on the cover. Uh, which looks amazing. So if you wanted to make that a little less calorically dense, if you're worried about it, you could make, say, like a ham sandwich out of the biscuit. Exactly. Have you done that? Is we it have. Any good? Yes, we actually did some breakfast sandwiches too, where we did a little turkey patty, fried an egg on top, makes the perfect sandwich. So are you two thinking about getting into the like $10 billion breakfast industry that, uh, ta- who is it, Taco Bell? Taco Bell and uh, McDonald's yeah. are now having their war over? Um, probably not. $10 billion. You guys don't want even like a small percentage of that industry. A small percentage might be nice. Something to think (laughs) about. (laughs) Mary's trying to convince me to have a food truck. So that could be an interesting place to start. What? Like seriously? A food truck? (laughs) Yeah, you know. I can't tell if she's. Lock up Alex in there. Where, where are you going to find your low carb audience to like drive around to? Well, the thing is, we wouldn't tell them that it was low carb. I think that's the key for some of these is trying to hit the people who you know, either aren't familiar with it or don't like the idea. You don't tell them. You just put it on the menu. They order it and you see what happens. So you're going to secretly go on a mission of driving around the country and trying to like, I could, I could imagine you finding a food truck that's parked and just ramming it out of the way so that you could replace whatever it is they happen to be serving with the low carb additions. Is that, is that the goal? It, it's a it's a dream let's call it that <laughs> it's a dream whether whether it would ever <laughs> actually happen dream. probably not <laughs> so that that's mary's dream mary's mary's life goal is to have a low carb food truck is that well, only if you could have payload effects every weekend <laughs> you'd be golden oh yeah oh there you go that'd be perfect that's an idea yeah because that there wasn't a, a big selection of food there period well, yeah, beyond the bars and whatnot, there really wasn't. Yeah, it was like Hooters and Whataburger. Exactly. Were basically your options for eating at Paleo FX. Well, you know, going back to the giving it to people who don't know what it is, that's really how I experimented with a lot of the initial recipes was we used to have a lot of dinner parties at my at my old house and I would just make items that I could eat because it might not have been my carb night. So I would make them. For everybody else and not really mention that it was low carb and it was always a hit. Did you get pissed off? Did it it ever happen where you hadn't gotten to it yet and they'd eaten it all? Yes. One time with the pumpkin pie. I I was very (laughs) upset. I should have, I should have known, but I didn't also didn't realize that it was going to be the hit that it was. So I didn't expect people to go crazy over it. So you're hoping that it tasted slightly like crap. So you would have some left over. Is that, was that the goal? (laughs) No. (laughs) And the last time you made it, I ended up eating it all too, and you didn't have a single piece of it. Nope. <laughs> well, it's good. It's kind of like having a garbage disposal yeah. that uh, you, you don't you don't feel like the food is at least being wasted. That's true. To <laughs> equate Mary to a garbage disposal. I don't know how she feels about that's that. That's funny because that's what my mom used to call herself when we were kids, and we wouldn't eat all our food, and she was the human garbage disposal. <laughs> 
Now, recently you guys have been um, featured on TV here locally several times on several segments. So what's the feedback back like on the low carb alternatives? Has there been any positive or negative things that you've gotten back? It's been pretty positive. You know, it, it was always a challenge. I, I wanted each of the hosts to try the recipes that I made. If they could try them while we were on the air, that was great. And uh, luckily two of them did. And it was kind of hard to tell if they were <laughs> pretending that they really liked it because we were on air because they didn't really make a comment about it afterwards. But they did end up eating it, which was great. And everyone was always excited when I brought the dishes and they loved how they looked and, and smelled and they were always eager to want to try them afterwards. So I'd say from what I from what I got from it, they it was a positive response. Yeah, and I think though that, that one dessert they tried, you were just making it for the show, so mm -hmm. okay, we tasted it afterwards too, and it was eh. Eh, just well. Sometimes when you're making something just to look nice to put on display, you don't you're not worried so much about making sure that it tastes really good. I just wanted it to look attractive to the viewers. So uh, same thing with making the recipes you take pictures of. Some some recipes are just hard to make look pretty. Yeah, and th this is actually a good segue because of those uh, those TV segments that you had were pretty short. You had a very short amount of time to throw everything together and get it whipped up and show people how to cook it and how to mix it properly. Uh, there was a crepe that you made on air. Uh, so, you, so you had to do these things pretty quickly, and I know that's always a concern for people, particularly men. They don't like to spend a lot of time in the kitchen, which I think is a shame. Uh, you know, it, it can be so much fun and talk about like a great date night. If you can get somebody over and like cook with them, uh, it could be a lot of fun. So, you know, you, maybe you should think about cooking more often, but, uh, you know, there, there's always this need for, I need something really fast uh, and not necessarily snacks all the time, but you know, what, what meal could I throw together in 15 minutes, very little prep. I don't have to think about too much. Uh, can you give us like two or three of those? Let's, let's go with dinner. Like what are some quick quick dinners, not a lot of ingredients, something really fast. Taco well, salad. Taco salad is an easy one. That's definitely something that we eat a lot when I just have maybe have been experimenting a lot lately and I just feel like making something really easy. Taco salad's great. Ground beef, you brown it in the pan, throw in some seasoning, you get a bowl of shredded lettuce, top it with whatever you want. If you don't, if you want to be really lazy, you could just put some hot sauce on the lettuce and throw the meat on top and some cheese. You're good to go. That's got to take 10 minutes. Yeah, if that. If that, exactly. And, and what I like about the taco meat too is you can make a lot of it and use it then for other recipes. So for instance, we had some leftovers and we threw it in a scramble this morning. Easy. So if something like make a large portion of, portion of meat and you can just use it for a lot of other meals to that also make those be simple too. Yeah, and, and taco meat is pretty versatile. Yeah, even cold. That's, a, that's actually what I do on a weekly basis. I basically make two pounds of taco meat and stick it in the fridge, so... You can throw it in anything. So, yeah. What else do we have? So, there's one. We've got one down. There's two more. Just simple five well, ten minutes. You talked about one uh, a recent podcast with the salmon, which is a great one. Yeah. The salmon's really really easy. You turn the broiler on. You throw a little olive oil, salt and pepper. Pop it under the broiler seven eight minutes maybe. The skin sticks to the pan. You slide it right off. Cook a veggie on the side. Easy. Yeah. That. Salmon, uh, in, you, you need to pick your piece appropriately. You don't want it to be more than maybe an inch thick uh, at most. But, man, it just cooks up so fast and so perfect. It's hard to even, if you make it in the broiler like that, it's really even hard to get a piece cooked that quality at a restaurant. I mean, it just comes out so perfect. It's amazing to me. Uh, not, not too long ago, I made a stir fry. That was great, too. Just chicken, chopped it up in small pieces, threw it in a bowl with a little, was it the coconut aminos? What's the vinegar? Yeah, the co a little bit of chili paste. A little bit of chili sriracha. paste, a little bit of, if you want to get crazy, you can throw in some onion, some garlic, but it's not necessary. Throw it in a bowl, let it sit for a second. I cut up some broccoli and just threw it all together in, in a pan. So the, the coconut aminos, for those of, if you don't know what those are, it's kind of like, it's basically like uh, soy sauce. Is we, You've got a fermented component there that has a, I guess, um, a high amount of, what's that called? Uh, glutamate is the, the flavoring. And for those of you who don't know, we actually have uh, more than four taste buds. We have a taste bud specifically for glutamate. 
Oh, interesting. Yeah. And actually, we and then we have two more also specifically for uh, detecting spiciness in food, uh, capsaicin specifically. So does that, for someone who can tolerate more spice versus less spice, is that a taste bug that's just more developed? What makes that then? Uh, it's probably a sensitivity. It's, it's exactly like sweet food. The more you eat sweet food, the less sweet it tastes. Um, and so the same thing, you get a desensitization of those receptors and, uh, there's also a psychological component there. Uh, you can just, you can tolerate it more because there's an expectation of what you're having. That makes sense. That also makes sense why on carb night or even when we're experimenting with a lot of these sweet treats, it's not something we have that often. So I might only put a little bit of sweetness in it and I think it's really sweet, but then I have someone else taste it and they're like, Oh, that's not sweet enough at all. Well, see, there you go. There's a good test. You know, they're eating sweet stuff a lot. That's true. <laughs> there you go. And salt. Salt works the same way. Uh, you know, if you eat a lot of salt, uh, your palate for salts can be completely different from somebody else's. And what's interesting about the taste buds and the science behind them is, you know, I've got this, I've got an article somewhere on Athlete.io about it, but that's all the way through our digestive tract. Uh, so your body is sensing things like capsaicin, the heat in peppers uh, through your entire digestive tract. It's sensing sweetness. Uh, all the way through your digestive tract. And these can have different effects. Um, most of them are poorly understood, I would say, at the moment. So uh, don't freak out and never eat anything sweet or <laughs> become Dr. Joel Furman and look like you're on the Auschwitz <laughs> diet um, because you're afraid of modern food. Well, one thing I thought of when you we were talking about, you know, things that you can add in is I was really excited when I found out a long time ago from you that we could add salt to things. Because previously, pre-carb night, that was something you know, I was always told to never have. Low sodium this, low sodium that, buy my, you know, get my chicken breast at the restaurant, make sure they don't put salt on it. And being able to salt things now or you know, use bacon and, and have that saltiness factor, it's made things just taste a lot better. So let's talk about bacon. <laughs> it's like when I was growing up in Indiana, there were these commercials all the time on the radio where this guy would come on and say, bacon, nature's perfect food. And these things, these ran constantly. It was like they were trying to get people in Indiana to buy bacon as much as possible, which at the time was a no-no because saturated fat was evil and animal products gave you heart disease and blah, blah, blah. But we've seen a massive reversal in the attitude towards bacon recently. Uh, some of it driven by the paleo movement. Some of it driven just because a pig is so damn tasty. Um, so what do you, you know, I know you use bacon in a lot of recipes. Like do you just, when you see a recipe, you're just like, you know what? I'm going to throw some bacon on there. Yes. A lot of times. Pretty I much. mean, even, even when we were thinking about the different ice cream flavors that we could have, it just makes sense to throw some bacon in there. Does it not? Did, did you try that? Did that? It's next on the list. See, I would think maybe bacon grease might be a good base for oh, the ice that's cream. that's interesting. But I don't know if I would want actual bits of bacon in my ice cream. What if what if they were chocolate-covered pieces <laughs> of bacon? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I tend to agree with you, sir. I, you know, I'm a bacon purist. I don't want it in my ice cream or my milkshake. I want it, like, next to my eggs. Right, but the taste... Yeah, the taste of bacon, though, could go really well in certain ice cream combinations. I just wouldn't want the bacon, so... Using oh, the, like, I see, just the flavor of it, but not the actual pieces yeah so making the like rendered bacon fat and turning that into ice cream somehow that would be even if it was crunchy yeah no well we have a jar of rendered bacon fat in the fridge so we might as well put that to use there you go <laughs> there's there's an ice you know, cream. i was at a, I, I was at a restaurant um a couple months back and they actually had a, a foie gras um appetizer dish and it was actually part of it was a foie gras ice cream and it was amazing actually so that i think that the bacon grease idea is the way to go what was it you were telling me about, Rocky? Oh, that was ghee, right? You were dipping your su sushi in ghee. Amazing. That it is the delicious. most amazing thing I've ever had. It was crazy. It might have been because it was a carb night anyways, but holy cow. Yeah, I was at a, a local sushi restaurant, and they were having it. It was their anniversary, and so they had something called their anniversary roll, and it was uh, drizzled with ghee. So, you know, being the... Uh, you know, crazy carb night insane eater that I am. I ask for some ghee on the side, and I just I use that as my dipping sauce instead of the instead of the soy sauce. I totally pictured you bringing a jar of your own ghee and dipping it in there. I, I'm well nowadays. I think about it now when I go <laughs> to the place. I haven't quite yet, but but yeah, it was it was just uh, one of the most 
uh, I, I think when you combine and may, again, it just might be me from my childhood combining rice and ghee together. It's just, uh, I find the taste almost, uh, it's just really just fast. It's just amazing. So have you tried the, the mock rice out of the recipe book with ghee, Rocky? Um, I, I, I haven't done the mock rice. I mean, is, is that, is it cauliflower rice? Is that basically what it is or? Yeah. I don't remember that recipe. Yeah, I've done that and it's pretty good too. It's not the same charm, but it, it, it you know, certainly as I talk about scratching the niche, it, it does that at least the very, the very least. So I've done that quite a few times is making cauliflower fried rice or cauliflower rice, um, just a substitute. It's just that from a simplicity standpoint, um, in a cleanup standpoint, I just, uh, I'm lazy. So, you know, to have to clean up the blender and put it all together, it may be another 10 or 15 minutes, but you know, again, it comes back to the laziness and what's quick and dirty. <laughs> right. And l- let's circle back to bacon and laziness because bacon is like so amazingly versatile. I'm just, I'm not giving up on bacon here. I really took to heart as a child that bacon is nature's perfect food. <laughs> I wish and, I had gotten that message when yeah, I was young. Me too. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty convinced you could substitute most things uh, in, in, in the diet with bacon and still be incredibly healthy. And you, you can do so much with it. So like a snack food. People are always complaining about needing snack foods. And a really easy one is to basically turn bacon into just this almost like cracker in a way. I mean, it's one way to describe the texture. And it's super simple, too. Yeah, you just it's, layer some paper it's towels. It's great for dipping in guacamole. Exactly, or sour cream. I mean, nachos. Nachos, yep. <laughs> so so go ahead, finish, finish on how you make this, because it's, it's so simple. Oh, you just ridiculous. layer a couple pieces of paper towel, lay your pieces of bacon on top, sandwich it between some more paper towels, and pop them in the microwave. I would say anywhere from three to five minutes, depending on how thick the piece of bacon is and how many pieces you're putting in at a time. But, you know, you, you want to cook it so it's crunchy, but you, you also don't want to burn it unless mm. that's something that you like. I prefer it it's almost slightly burnt, so it's still, but it's really, really crispy. So it's kind of the same process that I had in my in carb night for the pepperoni chips. Yeah, and those those things are good too. You got to get the right pepperoni if you want a pretty sturdy chip. But th- those things are And it, they're good. it's a great snack to go. You know, we, I get a lot of messages from people who just want something that they can take with them wherever they go, quick snack, and it, it's great because it actually stays crunchy. I find that they don't get soft unless you like put it in the cooler and you don't you know, put it in the proper container, it might get soggy from the moisture, but otherwise it stays nice and crispy and it's a great snack for just on the go. Yeah, and that's the thing too. You know, in the microwave, you get out so much of the fat, you don't need to put it in a cooler when you travel around with it. You know, most of the fat is out, so you're not going to have to worry about something going rancid. You basically just have these like protein chips. Um, salty, bacony protein chips. Um, if that, if that's not any closer to like the paleo snack world, um, I don't know. I don't know about all this cricket flour and all the other shit yeah, they that grind up bizarre. <laughs> yeah, and smash together so that you can have paleo treats when you could just throw some bacon in the microwave and you've got paleo treats. I mean, come on, we, we don't need all this exotic crap, uh, that pretty much goes completely against the grain of eating whole foods. <laughs> right. Uh, when you could just buy yourself a pound of bacon and then throw that stuff in the microwave. Then you can dip I've it I've done in. both of those, the pepperoni chips and the bacon for movie theater for going to the movies. Ooh, good so, thinking. So, uh, yeah, this, on a day that maybe I just don't want to do the popcorn or I'm trying to be good or um, it, it makes it really convenient to take the movies and have a treat. Just got to sneak it in, right? So That's never hard. <laughs> yeah, you need to, uh, you know, a substitute for popcorn would be amazing. I'll look into that. Let me see. Let me see what I can come up with. Yeah, I'd have to think on that one for a while because you you would need something that uh, kind of explodes but keeps its structure during the explosion. Well, they have those microwavable pork rinds. Microwavable pork rinds. Yeah, they're in the same type of little bag that that popcorn is. And you, I haven't yet done it yet, but I've I've seen them. And you just pop them in the microwave. I'm not really sure how it works, but it sounds interesting. Hmm. Yeah, you'll have to let us know how that goes. That for some reason that that doesn't sound very appealing to me. <laughs> well, what about just pork rinds then? Pork rinds are good as, as I, a snack. I mean, that's something you know you oh, get yeah. the you get the you know reaching the hand in the bag, same as popcorn sort of deal. Right, and you get the crunch, and they're usually great for dipping in uh, mustards. That was a great thing in San Francisco. So many different 
uh, flavored mustards and different mustard textures. And man, pork rinds were a great way to uh, scoop out some mustard. We've been doing it with salsa lately. Oh, yeah. Chips and salsa. I actually made the pork rind nachos last night. Those are amazing. I just dipped them in guacamole. They were really good. Too bad you can't get them like flat, like just totally flat like chips. Like pig ears. When you go in to buy pig ears for dogs, those things are flat. Those are almost like a chip. So why can't we have the same kind of thing with the pork rinds? I think it's just how they fry them. They just naturally kind of do their curling thing. So it's just a matter of laying it, you know, appropriately when they do fry it so it doesn't curl up. So you need to get like some pig skin, some fresh pig skin, Mm -hmm. and put it between two pieces of screen. Exactly. And deep fry that. And we could actually have pork rind chips. You just gave somebody a great idea. Yeah, I'm not sure how tasty those would be. (laughs) That's that's a lot of I wonder, collagen. I, I wonder if you could. I wonder if you could take those pork bellies from Trader Joe's and and fit, uh, slice them thin and then do it that way. Oh, that would with be a worth a try. Or something that mm-hmm. would be worth a try because that pork belly is delicious. Mm-hmm. Yes, with a mandolin. We have uh, one of those. Could, yeah, be, you know. could be kind of messy. Look, I'm in the kitchen, man. I'm in the kitchen. Yeah, no, I'm impressed that you that you knew that. I thought. I mean, you could have had like the ultimate cheat sheet and watched. Uh, what is that called, Chef? The oh. chopped. Yeah, chopped. You know they're always doing. You can learn a lot on that show, actually. You really can, because they have some bizarre ingredients. Yeah, and they do a good good job. They you you need to write into that show and have them do a low carb edition. I yeah. agree. That would be great. Don't agree with me. Write into that right. show. Okay, okay, it's on my and list. And have them do a because that would be awesome to watch. Well, especially if they get what if, then what if they get a carb heavy ingredient? Well, but that yes. that would be the, the thing. They'd have to they they would have to pick ingredients that were low carb, or else you know it'd be impossible. And then if they had to try to make a starchy alternative, starch-like alternative would be interesting. Well, right. I mean, that, that would be part of the whole process is to, like, make a whole meal. So just see if they would do something interesting. Like, you can't just take some bacon and throw it on the plate and be like, oh, look, it's, it's low carb. Um, well, I think the way you would do that, that show would be instead of giving them the, the basket full of ingredients, you give them the final product of the real food and say, okay, now you got to make this low carb. Go. That yeah. would be great. Yeah, but then you get everybody doing the same thing. You know, like how many how many different ways are you going to make? Um, you know, if you said your end meal was a steak and potatoes, then you're going to have everybody using turnips or cauliflower. Or, you know, you're going to get a lot of variety. Th- th- that would be a difficult show to stage, but I think it would be possible. We should just try to stage it ourselves. Like okay. A, I'll give you guys. I'll <laughs> give you guys like a basket of ingredients. And tell you to make something out of it. That that could be really fun. Yeah, that could be a total disaster. Too, That's true. You know, great, I'm gonna pick some. <laughs> well, you like, you would have to be then be the judge, yeah, so you'd have to taste it all. Some bad shit, crazy ingredients. <laughs> you put durian is what you'd pick. But oh, sure. oh, that looked disgusting. <laughs> is that not like one of the most disgusting things ever? Yeah, it is pretty horrible. I, yeah, yeah, I've heard. I guess it it's an acquired taste, taste right? Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, like. An enema is an acquired activity or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure how you ever enjoy that. Well, that's okay. I did think of another recipe that that turned out pretty bad, which was liver. So <gasps> we saw it. It was on. It was really cheap. We figured, let's get it. See what happens. We I tried to do a a fried version of it. it didn't really work out very well. I should have made the pieces a lot smaller. So that was actually one that we just could not eat. We tried. I ended up eating the. The fried part off around it. As some people love liver, and I don't know who those people are or what's wrong with them. Um, if there was some early childhood brain damage, but some people love liver, and I just don't understand. I've never been able to acquire a taste for liver. Like deep fried, I've had it so many different ways, and pretty much it's always either going to a dog or the garbage can. Yeah, actually, that that's pretty much what happened. Yeah, and you made Cooper sick. <laughs> the poor, the poor guy. They like feed him like a pound of liver or something. The poor guy couldn't go to the bathroom for two days. It wasn't a pound, but it was probably too much. Yeah, he's he's only a thirty pound dog. You can't feed him his body weight worth of anything. That's not good. <laughs> poor little guy. Maybe that's why he was depressed this afternoon. You know, he knew that they were going to come over. He was fearing the liver. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe because he knows he's going to eat it. He's like, it's so damn good, I'm going to eat it, but then I'm not going to be able to poop for two days. It's sacrifice. That's that's when you know you're a foodie, 
when you're at, you, you're willing to make sacrifices at that level to eat something. <laughs> well, that's kind of how I feel about cheese. I really like it, but it just doesn't agree with my skin. Well, that's what we were talking about. We've had that conversation on uh, previous shows. Have you been able to try some of the European uh, or goat goat versions that have the casein that's not as uh, reactive? I haven't yet, mostly because I've had a lot of events and like the television appearances and I just really didn't want to experiment with the the potential of my face breaking out when I needed to be in front of people. So I'm waiting to experiment for when I, I don't really have to be around people. Yeah, you got to try that out and tell I us definitely how it goes. Will. Because if that, if that works, I, I, I would be very thankful because yeah. I miss cheese a lot. Yeah, you've been somewhat sensitive to it. Uh, I'm, and perhaps I'm it's impressed. kind of like what you talked about at Paleo, you know, now that I've gone so long without having any, I have a tiny little bit and I get this really big reaction. Right. So the lesson is you need to just always eat cheese. <laughs> and then just deal with whatever comes yeah, up. <laughs> don't back off the cheese ever, because if you do, then when you try to eat it again, you might have some bad reaction. I don't know about that. I'm not convinced. Well, the, there's and, only- you know, we, and we've talked about it too. And I, I tend to break out, but I break out like with certain cheeses and not other cheeses. It's the strangest thing. And I'm talking about all dairy, you know, cow, cow dairy cheese that, you know, like certain brands versus other brands. It's really odd. So that, you have to wonder about the odd. quality of, you know, maybe the ones you don't break out to are really this much lower quality. But. Right. Exactly. Which cows are producing it? Yeah. I don't know. I don't have any problem with cheese, so I'm not going to worry about it. That's why Mary eats all the cheese, the cheese loaded dishes. Mm -hmm. So we've got uh, basically like one, one snack, the microwaved bacon. Uh, What else? What what are some other quick snacks? People, taco meat was another one that basically came up as something really, really simple. Uh, Are there any other snacks that are easy to make and take on the go? So you don't have to live by the cooler. Uh, Basically, you don't have to carry around a cooler your whole life. Can you, do you have anything? Like that. If not, that's fine because I can't think of anything off the top of my head really other than the, well, like pepperoni chips. I mean, eggs are another easy one. Kind of it's old school option, but another nice twist on it is you could soft boil them instead of hard boil them. It just gives you a different texture. You know, you can, I, I feel like it's a little more luxurious of a treat than your basic hard boiled egg. But again, something you can make a ton of. It's just a matter of getting the timing down right to make sure that it, it, it does come out soft boiled and not too hard. But that's another easy one. Yeah. And uh, hard boiled eggs are great. People don't realize as long as the shell doesn't rupture during the boiling, they'll last quite a long time quite out of the long fridge. Time. Yep. Um, you've probably got several days, although don't anybody hard boil eggs and set them out on the counter for several days and try it out. Uh, just because if something bad does happen, I don't want to be responsible. But I have had eggs that have sat out for a while, uh, mostly due to my own error that I went ahead and ate anyway, just because I didn't care. Um, and I have recently learned to be a little more careful with what I eat um, because of a, a few disasters that have happened. But, uh, you know, back in the day, I didn't really care as much. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, I might as well eat that. Um, and they last. They'll, they'll last a long time out of the fridge. Uh, and even when they're not cooked, as long Correct. as the shells aren't ruptured, you can store your eggs on the countertop. Which apparently is what most other countries do. We're the odd one. And it's mostly because of how we clean our eggs. That's the reason though, that we need to keep them refrigerated. How do we clean them? What, is it? what do we do? Uh, they go through some machine. Spray them with bleach? <laughs> no, but there is a, they go through a machine that then takes off this outer coating that naturally is on the eggs to keep them protected. And so because we, we remove that coating, they're more prone to uh, bacteria. Ah, so if you get farm fresh eggs, you can leave them out on the counter. Correct. No problem. Exactly. For quite a while from what I understand. Well, that's easy enough. You laughed when I said the bleach. I mean, we hose down the ch- most chicken, most uh, factory raised chicken, if you want to call it conventional raised chicken. It's, that stuff's hosed down with bleach. I don't know if people that's scary. That. Yeah. Yeah. You know, who knows what that's doing to us. That's why uh, actually Europe will not import chicken from the United States because they just bleach the shit out of it. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, which still doesn't help. It still has massive bacteria count. They should just like forgo the bleach. Forget it. Make us all tougher. Exactly. Uh, what else? Um, you know, we're pretty much at the end of the hour. Do you guys want to sum up anything? Tell, tell the audience where they can find your cooking adventures and get more ideas and, uh, your recipe book, uh, find out more information about you too. Um, you can go to fitlivingfoodies.com and we got 
several more recipes posted up there as far as and as other things up there as well and then you can go to transformingrecipes.com to find out more about our books and we have some really fun things in the works now so if you do like sweet treats stay tuned because we have some some fun ones i think you guys will like yeah we're excited i know a lot of people were disappointed that there weren't desserts in the original book you know with based on the feedback we got i expected more people to say that and there really weren't as many so uh, for those of you who who did request desserts they are on their way excellent we're all looking forward to them any any closing thoughts rocky um, no, I think that uh, the key thing here is that it really shouldn't be that hard to cook and to eat a low-carb lifestyle. And I think uh, if you look at the recipes in the book, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. That, I mean, it really is. It's not that hard. Yeah, that's one of the things I like about it is, and that's one of the things I liked about making the recipes in the original Carb Night book is they're all relatively simple and you get some great flavors. And Transforming Recipes, uh, the book, you, uh, you two, Mary and Alex, you took that to the next level. I mean, the flavors are amazing. A lot of them you can't distinguish from normal dishes. Um, you know, they're really fantastic. So, you know, it, it's it's a tool that everybody should have in their toolbox, uh, especially if they're going to go low carb or carb backloading or carb night. Uh, you know, it just it makes the diet so much easier. You can avoid the monotony and uh, just really enjoy food, uh, which is what a sustainable lifestyle is all about. Exactly. We want people to enjoy what they eat, look forward to what they eat, and not feel like they're deprived or can't have certain things. And that, you know, everybody should go to their website, fitlivingfoodies.com, and check out pictures of them. And I'm not saying this to stroke their egos or anything, but they look phenomenal. They're in great shape, and they look like that all the time. They didn't just get in shape for a photo shoot. They live what they cook, you know, they eat what they cook and they stay in phenomenal shape all year round. There's not a lot of fluctuation, you know, their health is phenomenal and, you know, the, these kind of tools make it a lot easier to do that. And that was the whole reason behind the book. Yeah. We wanted to share what we were eating because it was good and we felt like everyone else should be able to eat that way too. All right. Well, that's the end of our hour and another episode of Body IO FM. Uh, Cooper is actually passed out and having little doggy nightmares. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to sign off before those bleed over onto the feed. Uh, so thanks again for listening, everybody. And uh, if you want to find out more, go to body.io. And again, remember fitlivingfoodies.com and transformingrecipes.com. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. been listening to Body IO FM with your hosts, Kiefer and Dr. Rocky. If you'd like to hear more, log on to body.io. We'll be back next time with more science from the pinnacle of human health and performance.